Hi guys, I'm back and I know that in my last video I said that I'll be uploading more often and I didn't follow through with it. Um, basically, I was a little bit overwhelmed with internship and also my final sem in uni and I just didn't have time uh, to finish the research that I was doing for this video and now that I'm kind of done with uni, I had more time to uh, fully go in depth with this video. Um, and also, um, right now I have like, a bit of free time before I start my full-time job in December. I'll be working full-time in a tech firm in Singapore. So if you're in a related industry and you would like to like um, meet for like a coffee chat or something, feel free to DM me on Instagram. Uh, today is a bit of a heavier topic. I'll be covering the opioid epidemic in America. And I've kind of already had knowledge about what happened um, but I realized that a lot of people are not aware of the situation and I thought that you know it's always good to know um, about what's happening in the world so I decided to uh, do a little bit more research to share this information with everyone so without further ado I'll just dive right into the overview so According to the CDC, between 1999 and 2019, nearly 500,000 people died from an overdose involving opioids in the United States. Several pharmaceutical businesses like Johnson & Johnson, Tiva, Endo and Allergen helped fuel the biggest drug epidemic in the United States through deceptive marketing that downplayed the risks of addiction. But today, I'll be focusing on its main catalyst, uh, the Sackler family, who founded Purdue Pharmaceutical and released the opioid medication Oxycontin in 1995. The reason why I want to talk about this now is because in August of this year, the US bankruptcy judge approved Purdue's bankruptcy plan to resolve thousands of opioid lawsuits. However, the Sackler family, who owned Purdue Pharmaceutical, could still be sitting on a fortune of $14.6 billion by the time the last installment of their settlement of $4.5 billion have been paid. My research is focused on the Sackler family today because for the longest time, they have hidden behind the Purdue Pharma and tried to disassociate themselves from the epidemic and many people still do not know about their involvement in the crisis and how they are essentially getting out of the lawsuits as still one of the richest families in America. So before I move on with the case, I'm going to start with um, number one on my uh, puzzle. Oh. <laughs> Just one, okay. Um, just FYI, I haven't played Sudoku in a long time, so this might actually end up pretty bad. Um, oh, okay, since there's nothing for one, I think I'll start with two then. Um, two. down with two. Um, so before I get into the case, I'd like to introduce the main stakeholders in the Sackler family, the three brothers Arthur, Mortimer and Raymond Sackler. Though Arthur was not involved in the opioid crisis due to his passing in 1987, Oxycontin was only released in 1995. Many believed that he formed the questionable marketing practices present in the pharmaceutical industry and paved the strategies for his brothers Mortimer and Raymond Sackler on Oxycontin sales. Arthur was posthumously appointed into the Medical Advertising Hall of Fame and a citation praised his achievement in bringing the full power of advertising and promotion to pharmaceutical marketing, which honestly sounds a little bit weird. It all started in 1942 to help pay for his medical school tuition. Arthur Sackler took a copywriting job at a small ad agency specialized in the medical field. Arthur eventually acquired the ad agency and also ran a bi-weekly newspaper, The Medical Tribune, which reached 600,000 physicians at the time. Arthur saw doctors as trustworthy stewards of public health and recognized that selling new drugs requires an appeal to the doctor who writes the prescription. Arthur devised campaigns that targeted directly to clinicians by placing ads in medical journals and distributing literature to doctors' offices. Seeing that physicians were mostly heavily influenced by their peers, he also enlisted prominent ones to endorse his products and cited scientific studies which were often underwritten by the pharmaceutical companies themselves. Okay, now I'll just move on to three. 
and I realized that I might pronounce a lot of things wrong so I'll be adding subtitles when necessary in the editing I think um man I'm so stuck um this is so embarrassing I should have practiced before uh, filming the video yeah okay I'm just going to move on in 1952 the Seco brothers acquired a small patent medicine company Purdue Fedric which is what we now know as Purdue Pharmaceuticals and had equal share in Purdue as a privately held company with Arthur's existing advertising business, the Sackler Empire is completely integrated in that it can devise a new drug in its drug development enterprise, have the drug clinically tested and secure favourable reports from their connections with various hospitals, conceive the advertising approach to promote the drug, and have the clinical articles as well as advertising copy published in their own medical journals. Okay, let's move to four and wish for result this time okay. am I doing something wrong yeah there's nothing for four as well I'm so stuck okay so after Arthur's death in 1987, his estate sold its interest in Purdue to Raymond and Mortimer, the other two Sackler brothers. During the 1980s, Raymond and Mortimer had great success at Purdue with an innovative painkiller called MS Contin, a morphine pill with a patented controlled release formula, which means that the drug dissolved gradually into the bloodstream over several hours. By the late 80s, its patent on MS Contin was about to expire and Purdue executives, which includes Raymond's son, Richard Sackler, started looking for a drug to replace it. In 1990, a Purdue scientist sent a memo to Richard describing the ongoing efforts to create a product containing oxycodone. Oxycodone is a chemical cousin of heroin, which is up to twice as powerful as morphine. It was inexpensive to produce and was already used in other drugs as a blend with other components such as aspirin or Tylenol. However, Purdue developed a pill of pure oxycodone with a time-release formula similar to MS Contin. The 80mg and 160mg pills had a potency that far exceeded that of any prescription opioid on the market and it would be later released as oxycontin. Moving on to five. Yeah, this is really weird. How can I not be able to solve any of these? Oh shit. Missed that. Um. Um, in the past, doctors had been reluctant to prescribe strong opioids except for acute cancer pain and end-of-life palliative care because of a long-standing fear about the addictive properties of these drugs. Purdue had conducted no clinical studies on how addictive or prone to abuse the drug might be, but in 1995, the FDA approved OxyContin for use in treating moderate to severe pain and approved a package insert which in which announced that OxyContin was safer than rival painkillers because the patented delayed absorption mechanism is believed to reduce abuse liability. The FDA examiner who oversaw the process, Dr. Curtis Wright, left the agency shortly afterward and within two years, he had taken a job at Purdue. Okay, moving on to six. Oh my god, I'm finally getting a break. Yes. Okay. All soft. Perfect. 
Upon its release in 1995, Oxycontin was hailed as a medical breakthrough because of its bold marketing claim that one dose relieves pain for 12 hours, which was more than twice as long as generic medications. A 1995 memo sent to the launch team at Purdue emphasized that the company did not want to niche Oxycontin just for, can just for cancer pain. A primary objective in Purdue's 2002 budget was to broaden the use of Oxycontin for pain management. They targeted sales at physicians like general practitioners who were not pain specialists. Hence, Oxycontin was prescribed not merely for the kind of severe short-term pain associated with surgery or cancer, but also for less acute, longer-lasting pain like sports injury, where something as potent as Oxycontin was not needed. Also, Purdue was pinpointing communities where there were a lot of poverty and lack of education because numbers showed that they had more work-related injuries and were going to the doctors more often to get pain treatment. Okay, seven. Yes. Um. Oh, okay, I'm done with seven. Okay. Purdue had a speaker's bureau and it paid thousands of clinicians to attend medical conferences and deliver presentations about the merits of Oxycontin. Doctors were offered all expenses paid trips to pain management seminars and internal records from 1996 indicate that doctors who attended these seminars wrote Oxycontin prescriptions more than twice as often as those who didn't. Purdue advertised in medical journals and sponsored websites about chronic pain. They also convinced doctors of the drug's safety with literature that had been produced by doctors who were paid or funded by the company. According to training materials, Purdue also instructed sales representatives to assure doctors without evidence that fewer than 1% of patients who took Oxycontin become addicted. In 1999, a Purdue-funded study of patients who used Oxycontin for headaches found that the addiction rate was actually 13%. Purdue misinformed the medical community about the risks and patients grew so hooked on the drug that between doses, they started experiencing debilitating withdrawal. Okay, now moving on to eight. Eight. <clears throat> eight. Four. Eight is all done. Okay. Okay, um, so within five years of its introduction, Oxycontin was generating a billion dollars a year. In 2000, Richard Sackler told a team of company representatives that there was no sign of it slowing down. The sales force was heavily incentivized to push the drug. In a memo, a sales manager in Tennessee wrote, Dollar signs, it's bonus time in the neighborhood. Skillful salespeople were earning hundreds of thousands of dollars in commissions, and Purdue's sales representatives used data to figure out which doctors to target, and they knew when a doctor was running a pale meal but did nothing to stop them. Internal budget plans described the company's sales force as its most valuable resource. In 2001, Purdue Pharma paid $40 million in bonuses. Okay, moving on to number nine. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, nine. Okay, let's finish up like some of these. Uh, almost finished parts. Um, oh, what is here? What is here? So I can see. Okay. So. Remember Purdue's 12-hour claim? It was revealed that in a study conducted by Purdue, roughly half of the first patients to use Purdue 
to use OxyContin required more medication before the 12-hour mark. Prescribing a pill on a 12-hour schedule when, for many patients, it only works for 8 hours is a recipe for withdrawal, addiction, and abuse. Addicts started grounding the pills up and snorted them or dissolved them in liquid and injected them to override the time release mechanism and deliver a huge narcotic payload all at once. In a statement, Purdue acknowledged that even patients who take OxyContin in accordance with FDA-approved labeling instructions will likely develop physical dependence. The company maintains that physical dependence is different from addiction. Purdue did not stop the production of the drugs. However, it was their position that OxyContin overdoses were a matter of individual responsibility rather than the drug's addictive properties. Many addicts finding OxyContin too expensive or difficult to obtain have turned to heroin. According to the American Society of Addiction Medicine, 4 out of 5 people who try heroin today started with prescription painkillers. Okay. okay, this must be 1 because of this row. Let's finish uh, this part first. So in 2010, the company had been granted patents for a reformulated version of OxyContin. So this time around, if you crush the new pills, they become a gummy substance instead of a powder form, and the FDA had approved its claim on the drug's abuse deterrent properties because of that. However, the minor tweak happened right before the patent for the original OxyContin was set to expire and it was suspected that it was used to obtain a new patent and reset the clock on Purdue's exclusive right to produce the drug. Older people remain addicted to the reformulated OxyContin and continue to obtain the drug through prescriptions, while younger people, who can less readily secure prescriptions for pain and for whom OxyContin may be too expensive, have increasingly turned to black market substitutes like heroin. Okay, let's finish this. A recent series by the Associated Press and Center for Public Integrity revealed that in 2007, Purdue assembled an army of lobbyists to fight any legislative actions. Between 2006 and 2015, Purdue spent nearly $900 million on lobbying and political contributions, along with other painkiller producers and their associated nonprofits. In 2015, the company received FDA approval to market OxyContin to children as young as 11. The Sackler family also increased its effort abroad through a Purdue-related company, Mandai Pharma, and pushed the drug into Asia, Latin America, and the Middle East. Okay, one, three, nine, nine, and one. We're done. Okay, I had to skip an ad. Um, so what's the aftermath for the Sackler family? From 2008 to 2017, the family shifted $10.8 billion of cash out of Purdue, according to court documents. The multi-generational fortune is managed by at least four family offices and spans more than a hundred trusts and a web of holding companies, partnerships, legal jurisdictions and strategies. Their assets include billions invested with private equity managers and hedge funds and hundreds of millions in real estate. Mortimer Sackler died in 2010 and Raymond died in 2017. Raymond's sons, Richard and Jonathan Sackler, established a professorship at Yale Cancer Center. Richard Sackler stated that his father raised him to believe that philanthropy is an important part of how they should feel their lives. 
Marisa Sackler, the daughter of Mortimer, founded B Space, a non profit incubator that supports organizations like the Malala Fund. She recently told reporters that she finds the word philanthropy old fashioned and she considers herself a social entrepreneur. Isn't that just ironic? As part of their settlement in August 2021, the Sacklers have agreed to sell their pharmaceutical holdings and forfeit their equity in Purdue. In exchange, they will receive lifetime immunity from civil liability over their role in the opioid crisis. And almost 500,000 deaths later, the Sackler has the Sacklers have escaped liability over the opioid crisis and are still one of the richest families in America, while regular people have to grieve over their loved ones who overdose on opioids from a formulated addiction. So that's all I have for my sharing uh, from my research. And if you have any more information or if you have um, things that you would like to share about this uh, crisis, please feel free to comment and let me know. And yeah, thank you. Bye.